This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Kishore Mabubani, who is a writer, professor, and former Singaporean diplomat. He is dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. His new book is The Great Convergence, Asia, the West, and the Logic of One World. Kishore, welcome back to Berkeley. I'm happy to be back here. <laughs> uh, you, you, you come with an interesting background, having been a diplomat, but now you're an academic and, and as you just mm. said, a dean. So, so I'm wondering uh, the, what the interplay is between these two worlds as you sit down and write and reflect on the world. Well, I think the good thing about having been a diplomat is that you lose all illusions about the world very quickly especially when you represent Singapore and the UN Security Council, which is a fairly brutal place uh, where the five permanent members exercise their power in a fairly unashamed manner. And so you discover that whatever the rhetoric of countries, uh, whatever they may say, well, we, we believe in principles and so on and so forth, I've discovered that when it comes to defending national interests, power always trumps principle, especially in the UN Security Council. And uh, an important point that arises in your, your three recent books is, in a way, the disappointment in the U.S. response to the world as it has changed especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. so, so you are a person who, in your earlier career, really looked to America and admired its role in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but in recent time, uh, has come to be somewhat disappointed. Is that fair? Well, I, I must emphasize that I still continue to admire <laughs> Uh, the United States of America, as I mentioned in the book, uh, my three children studied in American universities. Two of my children went to Yale, one went to Carnegie Mellon, and indeed I got congratulations from my friends all over the world when my children got admitted into very good uh, American universities. So there's a lot about America uh, that the world continues to admire. But what I try to share uh, with my American friends is a new sense of disappointment with America. And the disappointment comes from measuring America not by any uh, abstract or global standards. Uh, the disappointment comes from measuring America against its own standards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my favorite example, which is a sad example, I must say, is that when America was for a long time the beacon of human rights for the world, and when it switched from being a beacon of human rights to becoming the first modern, developed, advanced country to reintroduce torture, uh, the impact on minds over, all over the world was shattering. The question was, how can the beacon of human rights reintroduce torture? One of your, your major points in your uh, critique, loving critique, mm. of uh, the United States is that uh, although it's set in motion many of the changes that the world is now experiencing through globalization, mm. that it, it's not uh, reflecting in its policies an understanding of the implications of that change in the world. 
it, it, your book begins with a, a, a beautiful description of global society mm. and, and the elements that have fallen into place. Talk a little about mm. that uh, because this for you is a, is a world that's been transformed. Yes, uh, in fact the, the great paradox uh, about our time uh, is that America has done more than any other country in the world to unleash the forces of globalization, whether it's through technology, the ideas of uh, business, the ideas of trade or free trade, all these ideas are American ideas. So American ideas have transformed the world and unleashed globalization. But paradoxically, having unleashed globalization, uh, America is one of the states that is now least prepared to deal with the consequences of globalization, to deal with a different world uh, that has emerged uh, out there. And we have actually created a much better world. In fact, the, uh, if you look at it in terms of human history, uh, it's a better world in terms of wars becoming a sunset industry. It's a better world in terms of global poverty disappearing. And it's a better world in terms of global middle classes exploding. So here, here's the moment in time for America to stand up and say, hey, we should be celebrating. We've helped to create this better world. And yet, as you know, Americans today feel more and more insecure as they view the rest of the world. And that's a tragedy. And, and you talk about a convergence of values. And many mm. of these values uh, reflect what America society was mm. over time. And, and now they, they've really been embraced by the world. The, mm. the, the scientific thinking, the market mm. economics, mm. Uh, uh, and, and others. Mm. Uh, so it's a... It's a it's kind of surprising in a way, mm. and you must be surprised yeah. by, no, by this. Oh, I'm very, very surprised because I'm glad you refer to uh, the word convergence. Mm. Uh, because, you know, for a long time, especially the last 200 years, it was only like 12% of the world's population who, who lived in the West who enjoyed this advanced living standards and, and access to various norms, you know. But today, the rest of the world, the remaining 88%, uh, is now converging on these norms. Unfortunately, I use a very inelegant phrase in my book called consensual cluster of norms. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, this consensual cluster of norms include things like modern science, um, um, free market economics, uh, rationality and logic, uh, multilateralism. And these are many, many of these things came from the United States, came from the West. And now the rest of the world is saying, okay, we're going to copy you and be like you. And that's why you notice throughout the world, uh, people are behaving more rationally and logically when it comes to solving problems, and they're behaving like Americans uh, <laughs> uh, used to behave. And so I thought, gee, this is the time for America to celebrate all this. And why are so few Americans celebrating this? Uh, you, you compare uh, America after World War II mm -hmm. uh, with the America that, that you were just talking about. And, and how do you account for the different role it, it's playing with regard to embracing the world and laying down a set of values, a set of economic principles in the earlier period, and then somehow rebelling hmm. against the world that it's been a major actor hmm. in putting in place. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, that's, that's, what, that's one of the greatest tragedies of our times, because the whole world as a whole is adopting many of the ideas that America used to push very strongly uh, especially after World War II. Let me just mention two. One is free trade. And, you know, I remember the days when American leaders would come knocking on the doors of every country and says, hey, you know, if you want to progress and move ahead, you, what you really have to do is to open up your economy and have free trade, join WTO and have free trade agreements, you know. 
And it's sort of very puzzling that the United States has gone from being one of the greatest champions of free trade to becoming a country where it's becoming politically toxic in America, to use the word free trade. And even President Obama, as you know, from time to time, would talk about fair trade rather than free trade. And this is, this is quite shocking uh, to the rest of the world. And that's why, as you know, that's one of the reasons why the Doha round is dying. And then another idea, which, of course, America was at the forefront of pushing, was international law. And America said, hey, the rule of law works domestically. It can work equally well globally. And Eleanor Roosevelt, for example, pushed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and said, this is where we want the world uh, to go. And then suddenly, the United States of America from, went from being the greatest promoter of international law to becoming, in some ways, one of the chief violators of international law when, as Kofi Annan said, uh, conducted a war which was illegal in Iraq, when it went against the International Criminal Court, when he reintroduced torture. So the rest of the world was judging America on the basis of American values and saying, hey, America is falling short in terms of conforming to American values. And that was a big shock to the rest of the world. At the beginning of your book, you quote uh, President Quint Clinton uh, mm -hmm. after he left office. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and what is very revealing is, in office, leaders such as Clinton uh, don't do what they clearly mm -hmm. see once they leave office. Mm -hmm. uh, and Clinton, I mean, the suggestion is, that he probably saw it before he left off it. He just wasn't going to articulate mm. that. Talk a little about that, because yeah. this is this is mm. not just Clinton's problem mm. uh, and America's problem, but in a way it can be mm. the world's problem. Yeah, no, I, I agree. See, the reason why I quoted the remarks that President Bill Clinton gave in a speech in Yale in 2003, because he actually was trying in a very gentle way to wake up Americans to a new reality. And he said in his remarks, I don't have the text verbatim, mm -hmm. something along the lines like, if we in America believe that we'll be the number one power forever, then fine. Let us carry on doing whatever we want to do. But if we can conceive of the possibility that someday we may no longer be the number one power in the world, then surely it is in America's natural interest to create a rules-based order that will protect America's interests and also constrain the next number one, implicitly. And as you also know, I, I also quote in the book uh, from a book written by Strope Talbot, who was Bill Clinton's Deputy Secretary of State. And, and actually, amazingly, Strope Talbot reveals in his book that Bill Clinton wanted to say all this while he was president. He wanted to actually wake up the Americans to the reality that America may no longer be number one. But his advisors told Bill Clinton, hey, be careful. It's political suicide in America for any American president to talk about America not being number one. And that's a tragedy, because it is inevitable that countries like China and India with much larger populations will have larger GNPs than America, it's just by simple laws of arithmetic, because if the Chinese perform 25% as well as any average American, they'll have a bigger GNP. So why not prepare for this new world now? And I, in a sense, what I try to do with this book, The Great Convergence, is to take the wisdom that Bill Clinton tried to share with Americans and develop it into a longer, longer argument. As a diplomat, you must have uh, uh, developed skills for uh, looking at a society, looking at a country that you are a diplomat to, and, and getting a fix mm. on what's going on. So on, on the one hand, in this problem you're identifying, public education is really important. Mm. And you're saying, but the leaders of the U.S. don't want to articulate mm. uh, what they probably know and can articulate after mm. they leave office. So, so what, help us, on, help an American audience understand what you think is at work here. Is it, interest groups that are being threatened by this transition, and hence our leaders are afraid to articulate the problem? Or is it our political culture where we 
believe we've always been number one and will always be number one? Well, the simple answer, Harry, is political culture. Mm -hmm. And as you know, another story I tell in the book uh, is about the time in January 2012 when I was asked in Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum meeting, to chair a forum on the future of American power. And I, on my right, I had two senators, uh, Republican senators, Cocker and Chambliss. And on my left, I had uh, two Democrats, Nita Lowy, a New, New York Congresswoman, and Michael Froman, the Deputy National Security Advisor. So the first question I asked was a very simple one. What do you see as the future of American power? And of course, they said, oh, we'll be number one, we'll be number one, we'll be number one. I said, fine, great. My second question was, well, you know, I've seen some statistics which suggest that sometime, maybe in the next five to 10 years, America may no longer have the largest economy in the world. How do you think America will react to that? And I can genuinely say to you that their answers completely shocked me because it became very clear that no senior American public figure can have any words coming out of his or her mouth saying if America becomes number two or when America becomes number two, because if they say that, it's political suicide. And in fact, Senator Cocker, I must say, was by far the most astute in his response. He said to me, Mr. Chairman, I can do the maths. I can see where you're taking us. I'm not going there. So it's a very nice way of saying, I'm not going to discuss America as number two publicly. And, and that is actually very dangerous because the paradox about America is that on the one hand, it is the world's most open society by any standards. But as you know, one of the most provocative things I say in this book, that today, America may well be an open society, but it may be an open society with a closed mind. And that's dangerous. And, and uh, what is the way around this? In, in a minute, we'll talk about the problem with the, these global I institutions and, and the way you see America responding incorrectly. What, what, uh, uh, what does your experience tell you about what makes for a change in this attitude? Is it when that day comes, they, America cannot suppress the headlines, mm. basically. Well, uh, I am actually quite worried mm -hmm. that when the day comes and the American public wakes up one day and reads, reads the headline that says, IMF declares that in PPP terms or even in nominal terms eventually, America is now the second largest economy in the world. So if the American population has not been psychologically prepared for this, this will be a big shock, and that you might have a huge divisive debate beginning in America saying, who lost America's number one position? Mm -hmm. And let's say if it happens in 2017, uh, I can well imagine in the 2016 political campaign, the Republicans will say, see, that was all Obama's fault. Eight years of Obama and America lost its number one position. And then it will become a divisive political debate in America when it shouldn't be a divisive political debate because it is driven by larger uh, correlation of forces which you cannot change in the rest of the world. And so when you have, when you remember that America only provides 5% of the world's population, it is unnatural for 5% of the world's population to have a 25% share of the global GNP, it just had to naturally shrink in relative terms, not in absolute terms, as the rest of the world began to perform better. And so America should actually in some ways celebrate the moment and say, you see, our ideas are being sh uh, accepted by the rest of the world. America is responsible for raising living standards rest of the world. Let's celebrate the moment. That would be a much healthier response than one that begins to becomes a very divisive debate that says, who lost America's number one position? Now, it, it, uh, on the one hand, you're, you're pointing out very effectively that there's a failure of the public discourse in the United States. Uh, but, but how does this work in the world? You, you do a, a, a great job of uh, looking at global institutions uh, 
Mm. And uh, uh, the way they have been structured in the past when the West had dominance mm. and th the extent to which they haven't changed, mm. basically. And so the, the global institutions, and, and let, let's talk about some of them, uh, have a configuration of power that reflects the old order. Mm. And as long as they continue to do that, then this uh, uh, blindness on the part mm. of the United States to these changes mm. is actually reflected mm. in the power structure of many of these global mm. institutions. Yes, uh, I think one of the key reasons why I wrote the book at this stage is to actually tell, remind the West that many of these global multilateral institutions, including UMF, United Nations, IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization, all Western creations. But sadly, even though they are Western creations, one of the dirty little secrets I give away in the book is that many of these institutions have been kept weak by design by Western powers because they actually believe that weaker multilateral institutions served Western interests. Now, actually, in a world where West, the Western share of global power is diminishing, one of the things I try to tell my Western friends is that it is now in your national interests to switch from a policy of weakening multilateral institutions to strengthening them, because these in many ways will protect your uh, long-term interests. But one of the things that's actually shocking to me is how few Western voices are aware that it's been Western policy to keep these multilateral organizations weak. I mean, I hear, I read New York Times, Washington Post, uh, uh, Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine attacking the United Nations as a weak organization, but they've never told the American people the, the simple truth that they are weak because it's American policy to keep them weak. <laughs> And that may have made sense when America was so overwhelmingly powerful. But as you move towards a world where America may become number two, as Bill Clinton said, then you have an interest now in strengthening them rather than weakening them. And as you know in the book, I make various suggestions on how you can strengthen them. And, and uh, let's take the security example, uh, Security Council as an example. Mm -hmm. This is an institution that came into being after World War II. There was a clear balance of power in favor of the West. And now uh, we, we have a situation where India is not a, mm. for example, a permanent um, a member with veto power mm. and so on. But, but somehow everybody knows this, that mm. the institution, this particular institution, mm. is not uh, working now to manage this new world that's that's mm. coming into being or be being a part of the mm. management. Explain that to us yeah. because it's it's yeah. and, and and the Europeans are a very good mm. example here mm. uh, in having over representation mm. while others are mm. not represented. Well, uh, you know, they're, they're actually on, when it comes to the UN Security Council, uh, there are two schools of thought on how to reform the UN Security Council. The one um, you might call the progressive liberal school of thought is the veto is wrong. It gives the great powers a chance to misbehave, and we should destroy the veto. Then there's the realist school of thought that says, hey, actually the veto is useful because the veto entrenches the great powers within the UN. And that's why the, re the fundamental reason why the United States, even though it's been very critical of the United Nations has not left the United Nations as it did when it left the League of Nations is because in the United Nations it's got veto power. And the United States has learned that its veto power has helped it enormously to secure American interests. So it's actually in America's interest to preserve the veto. And I actually, as a realist, say yes, the great power should have the veto. But the key point I make is that for the Security Council to be legitimate, it should represent the great powers of today and not the great powers of yesterday. And the fundamental problem of the UN Security Council today is that the five permanent members are there 
only because they won World War II in 1945. It's almost 70 years have passed since World War II. It doesn't make sense to have the victors of World War II. So this is why I've suggested a new formula where you combine a nation's, where you combine a, the, a nation's share of the global economy and a nation's share of the global population to figure out which are the most powerful nations in the world. And then I come up with a list of seven permanent members, seven semi-permanent members, and seven elected members to create a new Security Council 21, which I argue will now serve the interests of the United States, serve the interests of China, serve the interests of Russia, and serve the interests of great powers of today. And, and why do you think that uh, uh, the array of proposals, one, you're saying a, a more radical one, one a more conservative one, why is it that they don't get an audience, mm. they don't get political mobilization mm. among the, the key actors, and mm. you don't get uh, implementation of, of one or the mm. other? Well, there, there's actually a simple structural reason why UN Security Council reform has gone nowhere after 20 years. And the reason is that for every new country that is trying to become a permanent member, it has a neighbor that says, why not me? So every Brazil that wants to come in, there's Argentina that says, why not me? For every Nigeria that wants to come in, there's a South Africa that says, why not me? For every India that wants to come in, there's a Pakistan that says, why not me? But the most ingenious claim was made by the Italian ambassador to the UN, because when I was ambassador there, <coughs> they were pushing very hard, Germany and Japan were pushing very hard to join the UN Security Council, and the Italian ambassador got very upset. He said, excuse me, why are you all supporting Germany and Japan? We, Italy, we lost World War II also. <laughs> <laughs> so That's you can imagine yeah. the absurd lengths that countries went to to block other countries. So that's why, what's unique about my formula of 777 is that all the near losers become semi-permanent members of the UN Security Council and get automatically a seat in the Security Council at every fourth turn. So Argentina, Pakistan, South Korea, Italy, all get a seat, semi-permanent seat. So they also become winners in a Security Council reform. So that, that's the reason why my proposal is actually the most realistic proposal, because it, it sort of uh, takes away the countries who were blocking Security Council reform because they were going to become the biggest losers to making them also winners in Security Council reform now. And the veto re is, remains with the, the original? The, the veto definitely remains, and I would actually argue that it should remain because, as I explained in the book, the last thing you want in the, in the world is a confrontation between the United Nations and the United States of America, or between the United Nations and China. Because in any such confrontation, the United Nations will lose. So it's better to give the United States veto power, China veto power. So if the United Nations try to do something that, that Americans or Chinese believe is against their fundamental national interests, they can veto it. Uh, the, I think it was John Maynard Keynes who said that, that we live uh, uh, under the, the dictates of uh, dead philosophers, mm. basically, and their ideas. And in and, and, and justice, we must say that's true of the state system also, mm. isn't it? That, that, in other words, the way the state system mm. is organized mm. uh, leads these political actors, everyone mm. from uh, mm. uh, Bill Clinton to mm. uh, Vladimir Putin, to pursue Mm. national interests. Yeah. And, and at the heart of what you're arguing is this global society has emerged mm. and it's going to not stop growing and growing. Mm. It's doing all of these wonderful things in, in terms mm. of creating new middle mm. classes, lifting up people from poverty and so on. Mm. But in, in the end, there's no idea mm. to mm. represent these global interests or mm to show us the way toward mm. implementation. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And in fact, the, um, I'm glad you referred to John Maynard Keynes, uh, because one of the ideas that is actually a defunct political ideology 
that is unfortunately uh, crippling the world is this notion of national sovereignty. And this notion of national sovereignty, as you know, came from the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, almost 350 years ago. So it's really an idea that should have been discarded at least 100 years or 50 years ago. But it still continues to drive policymakers. So in an effort to explain to policymakers how the world has changed and why our mindsets should change, I use a very simple metaphor at the beginning of the book. I say that before when 7 billion people lived in 193 separate countries, it was like they were living on 193 separate boats with captains or crews who take care of each boat and rules to make sure the boats didn't collide. That was the 1945 rules-based order. But today, as a result of the world having shrunk, the 7 billion people in the world no longer live in 193 separate boats. They live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. But you have captains and crews taking care of each cabin, and nobody's taking care of the boat as a whole. And that explains all the major global problems that we are facing. So we have, in a sense, to, in one way or another, to gradually discard this concept of sovereignty and begin to understand that while you must, of course, protect your cabin on the boat, you must also protect the global boat. And that requires a new kind of thinking that my book tries to provide. And, and interestingly enough, you know, the, this book is, a, is a, a, a one way to awaken public opinion, in the, especially in the important states, to, mm. the, to these changes that mm. have been set in motion uh, sometimes by their policy or, or mm. their, or their uh, initiatives. Uh, but in, in the course of your presentation, you're, you're identifying a number of global problems. And, mm. and in the end, unfortunately, we may have to lie, rely on catastrophe mm. to, to essentially be uh, a more powerful mm. wake-up call. That would be unfortunate, mm. but you know, so as long as no one's listening, yeah. that may be the case. So, so let's let's talk. Let's look at that because if we look at the international economy, uh, we have the two thousand and eight mm. collapse, which you know mm. affected really everybody mm. in some way. Mm. And so, what happens? And mm. and why don't uh, uh, there's a short term solution mm. and a long term solution? Mm. Yeah. Play that out for us, because we don't well, get the result we would have hoped for. Yeah, and, uh, and th th this is actually quite puzzling. You know, we claim as human beings that we are, of course, superior to the other uh, animal species because we think rationally, logically, we use modern science, and so we should be looking rationally of uh, problems in the world and devising rational solutions, which, by the way, is what my book tries to do. But the surprising thing is that human beings only change or begin to change when you have a major crisis or catastrophe. And you saw this in the 2000-2009 financial crisis, you know. And at the height of the crisis, when the United States realized that even though it was so powerful, it could not save the global economy from going off a cliff, you had this remarkable scene where the most unilateral American president of recent times George W. Bush became the first American leader to convene the G20 leaders meeting. Not even the G7 leaders meeting. He realized that Europe and America couldn't fix this problem. It was so big. And that's why, as you know, it was a subsequent G20 leaders meeting in London that pulled the global economy back from the cliff that he was about to go to. And, and so when that moment happened, essentially what the leaders of the world did was that they came out of their cabins on the boat and they went up to the bridge and said, OK, we now have to work together to save the global economy, the global boat as a whole. So that, in fact, that actually demonstrated very powerfully and very vividly that we are in the same boat. And I quote Gordon Brown saying several times over, we are now in the same uh, global boat in terms of the global economy. But the, the tragedy is that as soon as the crisis was over, the G20 leaders went back into their cabins and stopped taking care of the global economy, and unfortunately began, in to some extent, what I call beggar thy neighbor policies. United States started QE1, QE2, QE3, 
uh, Europe was focused on its own internal problems, and now Japan is also unleashing Abenomics and printing money and so on and so forth. And that's very dangerous for the world. Because if you live in a single global economy, it's very dangerous when leaders just focus on their own cabin and not look at the whole global economy uh, as, a, as a whole. So I hope that, uh, I know that, by the way, I should emphasize one thing. I know that my ideas are ahead of their time. They will not be accepted in the next five to 10 years. But the way globalization is working, the way the world is shrinking, it is inevitable that at some point in time, you're gonna wake up and say, hey, we live in one world and we have to manage it as one world and we have to come together, come out of our cabins and manage this global boat. Now, in your book, you, you identify some of the obstacles to, mm -hmm. to the realization. We, we, we've talked now about these institutions and the short-term response mm -hmm. you get versus the long-term. Long-term, you don't, you don't get uh, a change. And uh, what, what I'm curious about, you, you, you have a career as a diplomat. You're, you're somebody who studies uh, international politics. How does power in, enter into these discussions? Because you have society changing, and, mm. and you're demonstrating that. Mm. New values, new economic prosperity on the one hand. Mm. And then you have uh, theorists such as yourself which are saying, well, the implications of these new, this new world are such and such, and we mm. have to move in this direction. Mm. But what comes back to bite us mm. is essentially power. Mm -hmm. And it's power that's undergoing change mm. because we, we're seeing some powers in relative decline, other mm. powers rising. Mm. But but it, it's this mm. this element in this mm. that is holding us back mm. from moving politically in the in the new directions you're suggesting. Mm. Yes, uh, uh, what I what I try to do in this book, and here again, I guess my uh, 33 years experience in diplomacy uh, was very useful because I, I I realized geopolitics has been around for 2,000 years or 3,000 years. And geopolitics will be around for the next 2,000 years. So even though I speak of us becoming one world, geopolitical games will continue. And as you know, throughout history, the world's most important relationship is always between the world's greatest power and the world's greatest emerging power. Today, the world's greatest power is United States of America. The world's greatest emerging power is China. And so if you're not careful, the US and China could go back into the old forms of rivalry like you saw with the United States and Soviet Union in the Cold War. And one reason why, in a sense, the message of my book is quite urgent is that I'm trying to remind the United States and China that while you will have to compete, and you will compete, I mean, competition among great powers will not go away anytime soon, but please remember that you also have common interests and you also have to collaborate. And the good news, by the way, uh, is that the uh, United States and China overall, to be fair to both of them, have behaved quite responsibly. And that's why, instead of seeing rising levels of tension between US and China, as you should have seen, with China in becoming more and more powerful, with America becoming more insecure, you're seeing lower and lower levels of tension between the United States and, and China. And it's due to combination of factors. But one of the factors is the fact that you have growing multilateralism. And the US president and Chinese president will often meet two or three times a year. Whereas in the past, as you know, the United States and Soviet presidents, if they met once in five years, it was a big deal. So the regular meetings in multilateral settings is extremely important and that's something that the world hasn't realized. This is why we need more and stronger multilateral institutions. And, and you use as the example uh, uh, in, in your section on geopolitics uh, the case of ASEAN, ASEAN mm. uh, and, and the changes there where you have a, a lot of small powers, medium-sized mm. powers, some big powers, mm. but, but in, over time, what could have been a, a cacophony of voices, mm. possibly in some situations leading to war, mm. that hasn't happened. Yeah, you know, I'm glad uh, you raised ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, because it is truly a modern miracle. I can tell you that if you want a, 
a glimpse into the future, go see ASEAN. Because ASEAN is by far the most diverse region in the world, you know. It has got Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, Taoists, Confucianists, and even Communists. And this is by far, in, by every cultural, linguistic, ethnic, religious standards, the most diverse region of the world. And that's why British historians used to say that Southeast Asia is the Balkans of Asia. And the Balkans of Asia should have, if you follow the old logic of history, should have progressively become more and more Balkanized, and you should have seen clashes of civilization in Southeast Asia. Instead, you've seen the exact opposite. And indeed, the most successful example of regional cooperation outside the European Union is actually ASEAN. Why? And that's what my book tries to show. The reason why this is happening is because a consensual cluster of norms mm. that I speak about in my book is enveloping Southeast Asia also. And the leaders of Southeast Asia are looking at each other and saying, why should we go to war with war with one another? It's stupid. It will prevent us from developing economically and getting along uh, and lifting up our people. And so the fact that ASEAN has been doing this, that the fact that the most difficult region of the world has succeeded in multilateral cooperation produces a lot of hope for the rest of the world, which is much less diverse than ASEAN. Mm -hmm. so, so how can this help us get over the obstacles that we've been describing? Uh, in other words, is, is, the, is the idea here that one of the multiple points of entry for changing the world according to what global society requires is to look at places like ASEAN as a the, the, the shining city on the hill in Reagan's terms that mm -hmm. that in other words that that uh, at, we, we have to hope for work toward the em emulation mm -hmm. of that kind of value consensus mm -hmm. and and change in institutions to then mm -hmm. uh, build the political structures that support the global society? Well, uh, before any of your viewers uh, get any, um, how do you say, misleading impression, let me emphasize that ASEAN is also hugely imperfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that ASEAN doesn't go straight forward in a straight line. In fact, I say it takes two steps forward, one step backwards, mm -hmm. two sides backwards. So it is actually a very imperfect uh, organization. But its, it, it's strength actually lies in its imperfection. <laughs> because it is normal and difficult, so it moves in very strange ways. But over time, it has created a much better uh, Southeast Asia. So if you can imagine the Middle East, for example, right? And if the Middle East, right, could create a regional organization that brought together not just the Arab League, that's easy, but had Israel, Turkey, Iran as members together. That's ASEAN in the Middle East. So this is why the ASEAN story is worth studying. And even, by the way, even in Northeast Asia, which has got far more successful economies, China, Japan, Korea, logically, because they're more developed, you should have an association of Northeast Asian nations, ANIAN, to balance an association of Southeast Asian nations. But paradoxically, that even though ASEAN, Southeast Asia is economically backward compared to Northeast Asia, politically is way up here and Northeast Asia is way down here. That's why the uh, ASEAN story is, is worth studying in detail. But the larger point here is that uh, American policymakers for whatever reason, have developed a, a, a kind of uh, uh, allergy to multilateralism. And if you are a multilateralist in the American Foreign Service and you talk about it too strongly, you're despised because you seem to be weak. You should be all about promoting America as number one. But actually, what I try to argue that actually what you need for the next generation of American diplomats is people coming out to say, hey, 
it is now in America's interest to strengthen this multilateral organization, including APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, including the East Asian Summit, because all these forums, by bringing together the leaders together regularly, are actually creating a much more stable and peaceful world. So you're saying, in a way, embrace these institutions, even though initially they appear threatening. But in, in the end result, if you're a rising power or a power in relative decline, mm. they are a path mm. toward reconciling your politics mm. to essentially, you know, what's going to emerge because of the global society. Yes. And, and in fact, what I try to say, and I, of course, I have to say it more delicately uh, in the book, but maybe I'll say it very bluntly here. The biggest challenge of our time that we have to manage is the emergence of China as the number one power in the world. Nobody knows. By the way, not even the leaders of China know how China is going to emerge as the number one power because they're still deciding. They're going through a period of deep introspection to figure out how they should behave when they become the American, when they become number one power. Should they behave like the United States did? when it was all powerful at the end of the Cold War, completely unilaterally, and saying, I'm not going to be bound by multilateral rules? Or should they decide, oh, no, actually China is better off working in multilateral institutions and strengthening multilateral institutions? And I know for a fact that they have not made that decision yet because they're thinking of what to do. But if you look at it from the point of view of America or Europe or the rest of the world or ASEAN, it's in our interest to persuade China to choose the multilateral route. And it's also an American interest to persuade China to take the multilateral route. But you cannot persuade China to take the multilateral route if the United States uh, either undermines or weakens multilateral institutions. So this is where a policy that may have made sense in a different era doesn't make sense anymore when you're trying to manage the rise of China. So, and, and the thing that's actually frightening about America is that if you go to the very highest levels of the American State Department and the American Defense Department and the American intelligence agencies, what's frightening is the lack of new thinking of how to manage this new world. There's a real strong desire to go back to old impulses and old tricks. And I, but I'm saying that the old impulses and old tricks will not work anymore in this different world. Uh, you, you identify uh, principles for reforming global institutions in addition to the way the, mm. the powerful Western countries have to change their behavior. Mm. Talk a little about that, because the irony here is when you put what you're saying together is you're saying, look, this global society, the people who are emerging mm -hmm. there, basically what in the long term they're asking for is essentially the principles mm -hmm. we've always supported, mm -hmm. uh, such as democracy, yeah. accountability, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the right balance of mm -hmm. power, and, and the rule mm -hmm. of law. Well, I, I suggest that uh, the reason why, uh, so far, um, almost all reform of major international organizations has failed is because people have tried patchwork formulas. So, oh, we should make Japan a member, permanent member of the Security Council, make Germany a permanent member, without asking, hey, what's the criteria? What's the principle for reform, right? And surely, you should first agree on the principles before you agree on the candidates to become the new members of the UN Security Council. So I suggest three principles to guide reform of international organizations. One is the value that America is the number one champion of, which is democracy. And by democracy, I mean that there's seven billion people in the world. And you must ensure that whatever, whenever you reform an organization, you must represent the wishes of 7 billion people. So if you have a new UN Security Council that doesn't have a permanent member from Latin America, that doesn't have a permanent member from Africa, it's going to go nowhere. You have to realize that Africa and Latin America 
because they represent significant chunks of the global population, must now have a seat in the UN Security Council. Second principle, I say, is that you must also recognize that there are power imbalances in the world. Not all nations are equal. And sure, and so as long as the China and the United States and India and Brazil are the new rising powers of today or the continuing great powers of yesterday, you must make sure that they are also represented in the, in the organizations in the world. And therefore, it must be the great powers of today and tomorrow and not the great powers of yesterday that should be members of the UN Security Council. And this is realism. Democracy is in some way an ideal principle. Recon recognizing power imbalances is a realist principle. And you must have the idealist and realist principles coming together in reform of Security Council. And to balance these two, uh, I add the principle of rule of law. And so I actually argue that it is in the interest of all countries in the world to advocate greater rule of law and greater transparency, accountability for these organizations also. So the UN Security Council, for example, has the permanent members have had great privileges as permanent members, but no responsibility has been assigned to these privileges. And that's why they can get away with doing whatever they've been doing. Now the time has come, just as in any domestic society, you wouldn't give the American president a lot of power without saying, excuse me, you also have some responsibility to go with the power, and you have to be held accountable for the use of this power. So just as you make the American president accountable when he occupies a position of power, let's also make the permanent members accountable when they're members of the Security Council. And these are fairly basic, simple, rational principles that we apply in any case in most societies and most organizations around the world, why not apply them to the leading global organizations? And bottom line here is that if you don't move in this direction, then you're going to not have the legitimacy that you need to make global institutions work and, and be a vehicle uh, for the global society. Mm -hmm. The key word is legitimacy. And, and now, again, the paradox is that as a result of education having spread globally, as a result, by the way, also of internet and of Wikipedia, mm -hmm. uh, the number of people today who have access to information, who make judgments about this international organization is becoming larger and larger and more and more intelligent. So if the UN Security Council doesn't reform itself and continues with this present composition, larger and larger segment of the global population, whether in the Arab world or in Africa or in Southeast Asia or Latin America, say, excuse me, these are the great powers of yesterday, the victors of World War II. Why should we listen to them? What legitimacy do they have? And this is why, actually, it will be a tragedy for United States, China, and Russia, who will we'll, we'll, we'll get the permanent membership anyway in the Reform Security Council. Why are they hanging on to an old formula that only keeps UK and France in the Security Council? They are actually sacrificing their own legitimacy to preserve the legitimacy of old powers like UK and France. So this is where, I, this is why I mean, that there's no new thinking going on in the U.S. State Department. There's no new thinking going on in American pol in the think tanks and all about what needs to be done to reform this institution. Because if, if America looks ahead at the future and sees that if he wants to preserve these institutions in the future, then it's got to change course now. Uh, an American audience listening to you uh, and uh, uh, putting aside how compelling your book is once you lay all of this out, will say, well, uh, the diplomat has become a professor, mm. and he's become a dewy-eyed idealist, mm. basically. And so therefore, oh, well, we have. So, so how do we respond to that? In mm. other words, uh, what are you 
drawing on, you know, in your intellectual journey to 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 you make a compelling case. I'm not mm. questioning that, mm. but the the what what I think you probably will find is that you're just dismissed out of hand mm. with with people applying mm. some notion like, oh, he's an academic, an idealist. This is not practical. Well, I mean, this is why uh, I devote so many chapters in the book uh, to the challenges of geopolitics, to the, the, the hard world uh, of real geopolitical issues we have to deal with. And I, uh, I, I, I've never been, you know, I should explain that in the, Singapore is one of the most pragmatic, hard-headed, realistic countries in the world. So I've had 33 years of being a pragmatic, hard-headed, <laughs> realist uh, diplomat. And I wouldn't have survived a year uh, in the Singapore Foreign Service <laughs> if I had been a dewy-headed uh, idealist, you know. So, and, and, and the, 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 the paradox actually here is that it's the, from, uh, I'm arguing from a realist mm -hmm. point of view and this is why I don't appeal to ideals to America. I'm not saying America, no, look at your ideals and therefore reform these organizations. No, 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 no. I'm saying look at your long-term national interests. So I'm appealing to American national interests. I'm appealing to Western national interests. To give you two specific examples, let's say a switch metaphors. We live in a global village. If you live in a global village, it is the most affluent houses in the global village that should worry about pandemics, right? Because the pandemics will come from the poorer sections of the global village. So you want to have a strong global village health organization. And one of the most shocking things I revealed in the book, that it actually has been American policy to weaken the World Health Organization. This doesn't make sense. It's, again, it's against American national interests to undermine the World Health Organization. It's against American national interest to weaken the International Atomic Energy Agency because you don't want proliferation of nuclear weapons either. So why are you, my argument to Americans is, why are you going against your own national interests in your policies? One final question uh, requiring a brief answer because our time is running out. You are a dean of an influential uh, international public policy school. How, how do we help prepare students for this future that's coming? Uh, what, what do you see as what, what they must prepare for? Because mm. this is going to be their world. But you know, I'm really glad you, you mentioned the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy because it's an illustration of how quickly the world changes. We are eight years old, but we are the third best endowed school of public policy in the world, the second most generous school of public policy out in the world after Princeton. And what we to do, most importantly what we do, we create global classrooms. And only 20% of our students are Singaporeans, 80% come from the rest of the world, from China, from India, from Southeast Asia, and from the rest of the world. So in that global classroom, when you walk in, you have a very direct feel of what the new global society is going to be like. And, and, and they, the students really everywhere must embrace that way of thinking. Yes, actually the surprising thing and the most encouraging thing that students tell me when they study at the Lee Kuan Yew School, they say when they come to our school and when they do a case study, they look at it through their national lenses and say, okay, the solution is obvious. This is what I would do in my country. And then they suddenly hear somebody from another country giving a completely different perspective. And, and then they say to me, Dean, I never realized that you could see the same problem from a completely different point of view. And that's what a global classroom does. And that's what my book tries to do also, to try to explain that, you know, the 12% of the world we, who live in the West must now understand the 88% who live outside the West. Well, on, on that note, Kishore, I want to uh, show your book one more time, The Great Conversion, Asia, the West, and the Logic of One World. And thank you very much for uh, writing the book and, and coming on our program. My pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. <laughs>